What a prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look biblically and kind of revisit the dynamics of this prayer that means so much to the world. It is found in two places in the Bible. There is a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer, and it's in the Gospel of Luke. You could go to chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. That's one version of the Lord's Prayer. And the second is in the Gospel of Matthew that we heard this morning. That's right in the center of what's known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he's giving a series of instructions in living the Christian life. And the Lord's Prayer, it has a number of titles. It is also known in some places as the Our Father. And the reason for that is because of the way the prayer begins. Our Father. It's also been referred to historically as the model prayer. I actually think there is another title and perhaps a more descriptive title of this prayer, and I would call it the Disciples' Prayer. Think about it. Jesus is teaching his disciples. It's the only instance we have in the scriptures where the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him something. That one question is, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus taught them to pray this prayer. So we can call it the disciples' prayer. If you are a Christ follower, then a disciple, then this is also our prayer. I'd like to briefly go through the pieces of the prayer. We've heard that in drama. We heard that in song. And now let's look at that prayer in word as well. The prayer begins with what all prayers should begin with, praise and adoration. It begins with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. One thing I'd like to underscore that maybe you haven't thought of before, it is how this prayer begins. It doesn't begin with my father. It doesn't begin with great white father or great black father or Asian father. It doesn't even begin with Allah, but it begins with our father. I think that is very intentional and very instructive. God is not just my father. It's just not my thing. But God is our Father. We cannot go anywhere without being together in this. I read recently that there's 30 wars going on in the world today. Most of the wars, they are civil wars. They're countries that are fighting among themselves. We have a tendency to divide ourselves by tribes. We divide ourselves by color. We divide ourselves by nationalities. We divide ourselves by ideologies. But this prayer, if you think about it, is a movement of bringing persons together around what? Our Father. Now, are there differences? Of course there's differences. Let me ask you this. Do you totally agree with all your brothers and sisters? But don't you have the same father or the same mother? There is something about that dynamic of being a part of the family of God. And so it begins with our father. Doesn't mean that we all agree. But there's something about that dynamic that there is the human family, if you will, that we are all a part of. But then the prayer, it zeroes in where it says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, what does that word mean? It means holy or to be held in reverence. 
So when I pray, it is a reminder when I say, hallowed be your name, it is a reminder of the name that I carry. When I go out into the world, when you go out in the world, we carry God's name. And here's the awesome reality. We reflect God's reputation in our life. We make God's reputation what it is. So what I pray is God allow me to carry your name and your honor because how the church expresses that is a reputation of God. I like a kind of a street vernacular. Live in such a way that the preacher won't have to lie at your funeral. Okay? I think about carrying God's name and God's honor. And how I react to other people reflects that as well. How I act, a joke I tell, a joke I laugh at. A suggestion I make, it all reflects ultimately God in our world, God's reputation. So every time when we pray, hallowed be your name, we need to also think in terms of how am I reflecting God's reputation? Hallowed be your name. And then the prayer goes on. It's kind of the, the matter of the kingdom we live in. And that we may be in the will of God, for it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can't think of that prayer then, knowing that not too long after that, Jesus was on the cross. He prayed, may this cup pass from me, but then he said those remarkable words, but not my will, Father, your will be done. Jesus carried that prayer that he taught of the Our Father all the way to the cross. And in it, I am reminded also of my dependence as I pray this prayer to live in God's will, but also of the needs that I have as I embrace in his will and become the whole person that God has created me to become. And so as you look at the model of the prayer, as it moves from God's kingdom coming and his will being done, there's three needs that are mentioned. Three needs, that, and they are true for every one of us. And these three needs that we find in the Lord's Prayer, they deal with something in our past and something in our present and something in our future. The first one. Give us today our daily bread. I like that. You don't need any more from the drama. That was spectacular. <laughs> daily bread, though. It has to do with what I need today. Today. Physically. Spiritually. To attain the purposes that will honor God. And that those things that God created me for to be about will be realized. On Sundays when we gather for Holy Communion and we recite those words of Jesus where he said, this is my body that has been broken for you. It reminds us of how he is the bread of life and of Jesus' commitment when he said, this is for you, of his commitment to provide me with every daily resource I need, physical and spiritual and mature, to honor God in my life. And the same is true about the daily needs of the local church. We trust God, and God has been faithful that every day, what was needed for that day to be done was done. And then there is a second great need that we all have, and it is the need of forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that deals with my past. 
and the need to forgive myself. Not just as I forgive another, but to forgive myself. Because a lot of us carry so much subconscious, unforgiven junk that we deal with inside. And as long as we have that going on in our lives, we can never be free from the past so that we can focus on God's future. Now, you may have noticed where it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's an interesting line because forgiveness essentially is letting go of my right to get even when someone has hurt me. But that's an interesting phrase because we know that there's different versions of the prayer. And some of you may wonder, what's going on here? Why do I go to one church and I hear some words and I hear another? Well, first, just to let you know biblically what's there, Matthew's gospel in the Bible, it uses debts and debtors. That's straight out of the scripture. And I mentioned there's the second version, the shorter version of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Luke. Luke uses sins and sinners. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So nowhere in the Bible do you see trespasses and trespass. That word has an interesting history to it. That was first used in 1526 when William Tyndall made a translation of the Bible and used the words trespass, trespasses. And what is trespass? It's going where you shouldn't go. It's being at a place where you shouldn't be. It is essentially a legal phrase. So after Tyndall used that word in a translation, it was in 1549 that the Church of England adopted it for the Book of Common Prayer. And that's how in a number of our primarily Protestant Reformation on churches, you find that word was used. But if you're looking at just a biblical use of the word, it's either debts, trespasses, or sin. They're all the same, okay? It's an innuendo. Debt could also be a price for salvation that is forgiven. A trespass is an unlawful act. They say the same thing. And it's just another historical illustration of how the church in worship would evolve things that would be more relevant in its language. And the church continues to do that, as worship today is very different than the early church. I mean, they didn't have all the stuff that we have now for projections, but ways of using the arts. And then there is a third great prayer and great need, and that is to pray for strength to live the kind of life that God has challenged us to live. And that is, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That third great need is protection from the temptations that could rob me of the life that God called me to be about. It is to pray, Lord, free me or protect me from those things that can just derail my life. Derail me from God's purposes in my life so that I may fully attain the future that God has created me for. I need protection there. Three great needs that I remember every day in prayer. They are dependence upon God for the daily provisions, for forgiveness of myself and others, and freedom from the things that can derail me from God's future. Now, a number of you may have heard a postscript to the prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, one thing, it's not in the Bible. It's nowhere there. It's not used in all churches. Some churches stick with the biblical version of it. But it was not included in the, most of the scriptures because it was not in most of the ancient, most ancient and reliable sacred texts that we have. That expression, it does go back with quite a history. It was around 100 AD that it was adopted as a doxology to the prayer that our Lord taught. And a doxology 
It's simply a liturgical expression of praise to God. It's like hearing something and saying, amen, or glory to God, hallelujah, yes, make it happen. And when we say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, there's some theologians that actually believe that those are also words that relate to the Trinity. For thine is the kingdom, it relates to God, the creator. The power relates to God, the Holy Spirit. And the glory relates to Jesus the Son, who was resurrected in glory. So it's not uncommon in in the history of worship and liturgy for doxologies to be added because they complement and they point us to what the prayer is about. So in conclusion, the Lord's Prayer is the most unique prayer in the Bible. And in all of the instructions of Jesus to his disciples, I'd like to conclude with what John Dominic Croisson, in his book, The Greatest Prayer, wrote about the Lord's Prayer. I think he's on target. Listen to these words. The Lord's Prayer is Christianity's greatest prayer. It is also Christianity's strangest prayer. It is prayed by all Christians, but it never mentions Christ. It is prayed in all churches, but it never mentions church. It is prayed on all Sundays, but it never mentions Sunday. It's called the Lord's Prayer, but it never mentions Lord. It is prayed by fundamentalist Christians, but it never mentions the inspired and errant word of God or the virgin birth or miracles or the atoning death or bodily resurrection of Christ. Never mentions those. It is prayed by evangelical Christians, but it never mentions evangelism or the gospel. It is prayed by Pentecostal Christians, but it never mentions ecstasy or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is prayed by Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Roman Catholics, but it never mentions congregation, priest, bishop, post, pope. It is prayed by Christians who have split historically over this or that doctrine, but it never mentions a single doctrine. Think about that. So my friends, if you think about it, if there is anything to take away as Christ followers embrace this prayer our Lord taught us, it is this conclusion, and this is what I'd like for you to take with you when you go home. The true test of solitude prayer is not whether a person gets what he or she asks for, but the effect on life from a habit of talking with God. Prayer has a way of grabbing hold of our heartstrings.